Anik, great to have you here at the Dubai Fintech Summit. We are in the Emirates NBD podcast studio. Um, so yes, Anit Daniel, Group Head of Transaction Banking at Emirates NBD. Welcome. Thank you, Sean. Pleasure to be here. How are you doing? I'm good. This is not your first Dubai Fintech Summit, is it? No, there's a second one. So there's a second one on the calendar for the Dubai Fintech Summit and my second one. Okay, fantastic. You've got a bit of experience in transaction banking, I guess. How long have you been involved in transaction banking? Uh, I think between two stints, a little over six years. Okay. And so for for those in the audience that perhaps don't know exactly what it means, what sort of your remit and, and responsibilities? So transaction banking basically covers the product arena for wholesale banking clients, where we look at products centric around cash management and trade finance. So if you look at any corporate clientele, their working capital requirements hinge around making a payment or receiving a payment. Trade finance and cash management are basically products that help you either receive or pay money, which are required for your working capital cycle. And that's what transaction banking as a team does within ENBD. So what we do is we help design products that can be used by the clients for their working capital financing gaps. We work on digital channels which allow customers to submit their transactions online to us, make it more seamless. We work on technologies that allow them to integrate with our systems directly via their ERPs using APIs and and a host of other digital services that we do. But essentially, it's basically doing everything that requires to be done for managing the client's working capital cycle. Got you. And in terms of clients, uh, I'm guessing this is an international uh, remit. What kind of clients? Could you give us a bit of a picture? So we uh, service all the clients within the Emirates MBD umbrella, and that includes clients from the SME, micro SMEs, all the way up to the large corporates, the family houses, and the MNCs. So we've got, um, it's a very wide remit. We cater to all of their requirements. And we also look after clients in our other geographies where we operate, Egypt, Saudi, London, Singapore, uh, India. So these are all markets where we have ENBD presence. Uh, so we, t- we take care of their requirements as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're at the Dubai FinTech Summit. Obviously, we're going to be talking about financial technology. Can you give us um, a few uh, highlights of what's been going on in transaction banking at Emirates NBD in terms of FinTech and digital transformation? Okay, sure. I think historically, we were always very functionally uh, dependent in the sense that we would go for function more than experience. So there were so many innovations happening within the country itself in terms of new payment methods, new payment trails. We were busy trying to build all that we could to make sure that we offer all of those services as a function to our clients. Mm. In the last 18 months to two years, we've changed our focus a little bit. And that's largely backed by the fact that the bank was going through a transformation project. We've now finished the transformation project and we've now got the building blocks to build on that uh, transformation IT stuff that we've done to come out with new and innovative things that we can do for the clients. So a lot of our build today is now focused on giving not just the function side of it, but also the UI, UX side of it. So we've got several projects that are being, uh, let's say, worked on right now, which are focusing on not just giving the building blocks of what that product or what that feature should be, but also about how that interaction with the bank should be. How easy should, how easy can you make it? How seamless can you make it? Now, in the corporate world, that's usually a very, very complex piece because you have companies who operate as single owner structures to shared service companies where you have 40 companies or 50 companies being managed by one treasury. Very, very bespoke requirements, very, very bespoke journeys. Some have, you know, uh, a board resolution, which is very simple to follow. Some have very, very complex entitlement matrix that they like to follow based on the structure of the company. So corporate banking, when it comes to digital channels and to be able to build all of these services, then gets into a very bespoke arena when you look at how do you build the right UI UX for your clientele. That's a lot of work that we've been investing into over the last couple of years. Some of it ourselves, some of it in collaboration with fintech partners, where we don't want to build the whole thing ourselves, but we would rather use somebody who has the know-how, who has the ability and can complement what we do then we'd rather complement that rather than build it ourselves. So we work with a lot of partnerships as well. So a lot of that stuff, eventually, if it makes sense for the bank, could translate into an equity investment as well, where the bank thinks it's something that where we can add value and take those businesses into other markets where Emirates and is present and help them grow and use the same technology 
across all our markets. So that's a lot of what is happening right now. Yes, that does sound. So, okay, so we've changed our core banking infrastructure ready for the digital age. Um, and then now we're building these new experiences for our clients. But I think if I replay what you're saying, in, in the retail space, um, it's less complex, right? And people are used to sort of, you know, all these apps uh, and digital experiences. But then when you move to the corporate space, you're talking, you know, API integrations, legacy systems, um, and the client requirements, as you've just highlighted, are also quite um, complex and, and unique and bespoke. I wouldn't say retail is less complex. Retail is as complex. As complex, okay. But given that it's the first space that you've seen most of the disruption happen in, you've not seen that disruption happen on the wholesale banking side. Hmm. That's largely because of the way companies operate, because there's no single authority who can take a call, right? You will have a company who has a board resolution and a mandate where X number of people are responsible for that decision. So it's never a single journey that can happen on the on the app. So to that extent, yes, it is a little bit more, it's different. Uh, each are complex in their own rights. Retail has a very different complexity when it comes to managing customer expectations, being fast, being uh, you know robust in your systems uh, and building that whole customer journey where you can do everything in one place. Yeah. Corporate banking, because it's a lot more bespoke, you have to do a lot of deep diving with each of the customers, understand what their uh, operating process is, understand how they like to process their uh, transactions and then try and see how do you make that fit within your ecosystem with customizations of bespoke. Yeah, that makes sense. So you talk to some of our customers every day, right? So what are some of the big challenges that they kind of talk to you about that you kind of see repeated across customers? So if you were to look at just the same way that we've gone through a transformation and we've changed our IT systems and we've, we've basically upskilled on the IT side, right, in terms of our capabilities. Uh, customers are doing the same thing, but mm. it's the same uh, classic debate of there is a limited amount of money and where do you invest that money? So a lot of focus goes into front-end investments for our customers as well. So they invest a lot into, let's say, uh, payment gateways mm. or how their customers will be checking out a particular payment if it's on the retail side of the business or similar such customer-focused initiatives which give you uh, more customer outreach, better customer footfall, more technology uh, work around that side. But a big piece of investment actually also goes into your backend systems, your ERPs. How do you make your ERPs more efficient? How do you make uh, your payment systems more efficient? How can you receive money more efficiently and collect money more efficiently? Because as I started off by saying, right, we're talking about working capital. If you're able to create a negative working capital cycle, then you basically don't need money for financing. Mm. And that is where you drive the best efficiency out of this business. So a lot of corporates are now getting into doing some of that within the financial space. So in their back offices, some are looking to set up shared service centers, which can manage things at scale across different geographies and across different companies in multiple verticals for diversified entities. Some are looking to do API integrations where you don't have to come to the bank or access it on online banking. You can just wire through your ERPs, come straight directly to the bank for a transaction summit. Some are investing heavily, or not some, I would say, everybody is investing heavily into the reconciliation space. Mm. One of the biggest areas where customers want relief is to be able to reconcile payments. What's in your account statement? Does it match with what you had originally set it out to be? Have all the payments come in? Did you receive the right amount of money? Did you receive short payment? These are things that need to be tracked on an everyday basis, in some cases, on an every hour basis. Because every payment that links to something that you're receiving is also linked to something that you're delivering on the other side for the customer. Mm. For example, if you're an auto dealership, you don't release the car till you get paid, right? How do you ensure that you've got paid? and which amount corresponds to which payment. Yeah. And that's very important because unless you're able to deliver that to the front end, your front end sales guy is not gonna be able to give that maximum customer experience to the person who's actually buying the car. Imagine if you and I are standing there waiting to take delivery of our car and the guy on the sales counter says, sorry, I can't track your payment or I can't trace your payment. You're gonna get wild. We say, come on, I paid you a day ago yeah. and you still haven't been able to give me the delivery of the car. I think this is the most important area for companies to now work on. How do you integrate that side of the customer experience with your financial reconciliation so you're able to give a better service on the front end? So we see a lot of work happening on reconciliation, reconciliation-related tools, the interaction between uh, the finance team and the banks have grown much, much uh, bigger. 
and a lot of it is now IT focused because they're also looking to see how they can operate this more efficiently. I mean, in the old days, if you had to send out statements to customers, you would put five people behind in the back office and would be generating Pushing a paper. printout and yeah. sending a courier. You don't do that anymore. I mean, it's not efficient anymore in, in what we have in terms of technologies. Mm. And it's very much the same thing that's happening with corporates. They're looking to reinvent their back offices to see where they can drive more efficiency out of this business and how they can do that. And we collaborate with a lot of them in, in ideation sessions where we're actually working with them to see what makes the most impact. Yeah. So you're thinking about not only your customers, but the customer's customers and, and where they're going. Correct. Yeah, fantastic. And so actually, if we could highlight a particular example where we've made some moves in this space, I think you mentioned payments tracking. Is that something we've invested in? So payment tracking is something that we've invested in uh, recently. We just launched out the phase one, first phase of that. Mm -hmm. What Payment Tracker does is, again, it's a very similar experience with all of us, right? So you make a payment and you have no idea whether the bank sent it forward, where it is in the queue, has the beneficiary received it, did he receive the full amount of money, what charges got deducted, so on and so forth. A lot of customers used to call us and tell us that, you know, it's a black hole. Mm -hmm. Once we've given that request to you, we don't know where it is in the queue. And we don't know where it is in the entire payment chain. So we don't know. Sometimes you come and tell us it's with X bank or it's with Y bank and it's not reached there. We want to know what's happening with it mm -hmm. because we want to know that the person who we've paid the money to has finally got the payment or not. So we've invested a lot of time and effort in building a payment tracker internally. Thanks to Swift uh, making available GPS services, there are some things that we can get from the Swift network itself in terms of status of payments once it leaves Emirates NBD. Mm. But within Emirates NBD also, we've upgraded our entire system to a more event-based architecture where every stage of the payment process, we now are able to generate events which we can show to the clients on their tracker, which tells them where exactly their payment is in the queue. Uh, is it good? Great. Does it? Is it? Is it more uh, beneficial? Yes. But it also poses a huge challenge for us as a bank because what I'm also exposing is how much time do I take to process a transaction? Yes. So I have to equally invest on that side to make sure that we release the transaction equally fast as well. Yeah, moving we from don't... batch processing to instant processing. Correct. So, I mean, starting from receipt of the transaction to compliance checks, to screening, to various systems that the banks uses to process payment, mm -hmm. you have to condense that and arrive at a reasonable amount of time that you would take to release a payment because mm -hmm. customers are looking for instant gratification in a sense that you've released the payment, I can get a swift copy and know that it's gone. It's there, yeah. And that's just payments, right? There's a lot of other things happening in your world. Are there any little nuggets that you could share with us? Lots of them. I mean, um, if you look at Recon as an example, yes. right? As we spoke about Recon, and if you look at real estate, every large developer out there is selling properties. You, me, when we buy properties, we make uh, we agree to a payment plan and we remit money to the developer's account. Now, for each project, the developer has to keep a track of the name of the unit, I mean, the number of the unit, mm -hmm. the person who's bought it, which installment has he paid, how many installments has he paid for, how many are due, and how many is he going to pay. So how do you, in the old world, how would you do it? You will have one single account, everybody's paying into that account, and there is no way you can figure out. Manually reconcile. Other than manually sitting with a file and with a printout and figuring out who's paid what. And then you have to reach out to the bank Many times we're asking for more information about a particular payment, more details about the payment, so you can actually figure out who's paid it. And now using virtual accounts and APIs, what developers can do is for every project that they launch, they can open virtual accounts under the same escrow account that we use for each individual unit within that project. And using that virtual ledger, now you can track payments, both ins and aggregate up to your main ledger for all the payments that you receive on that particular project. And depending on how you set up the virtual account infrastructure, you can generate reports at an account level. So for example, if Sean's purchased something, let's say you purchased maybe one unit or maybe more one than- day, One day, one day I will, yes. <laughs> more, than, more than two units, right? We could track at an aggregate level at how much you owe the developer yeah. per unit. Yeah. That's the level of granularity that that recon service gives you. And it takes away the entire load of having somebody sit 
with a printout of the account statement. And any errors as well, manual errors. No, that sounds like a headache solved. That's really interesting. Okay, cool. So the, thinking about our customers and thinking, you know, the problems for their customers and solving them and building the right sort of digitally native experiences for them. If you look to the future a little bit, right? We're at the Dubai FinTech Summit. What are some of these technologies that you're looking to integrate or some of these FinTech solutions that you're interested in? What are the big spaces that you're looking at right now? So for this year, we've, uh, I mean, payments always continues to be a major focus for the bank. Uh, I call it the blood in the body mm. of the bank, mm. because if you don't have payments, then you don't necessarily have a way of transmitting the key uh, factor, which is money. I mean, yeah. that's the whole exchange or the principle on which the entire commerce is built from. So for that, for us and for our client, whether it's retail, whether it's SME, whether it's large corporates, small corporates, governments, etc. Payments are very, very integral to what they do on a daily basis. So we will continue to invest in that space in technology, which allows us to give this. I mean, there are four things that customers want from us in the payment space. One is instant payments. So they want to be able to make a payment, which is instant. Uh, when I mean instant, I also mean that not just released from ENBD instantaneously, but also the beneficiary getting the credit within, let's say, 30 seconds or 60 seconds. That's an instant payment network. Mm. The second thing that customers want us to do is to do that with a great deal of security. So their data is protected, their payment systems are protected, and their money is protected. So security becomes very, very important in how we build any of these. So it's a big area for us to invest in, look at fraud, look at secure systems, etc. The third thing that customers want uh, is for that to be as cheap as possible, least expensive. And how do you do that? You need to figure out what's the shortest route to that payment. Mm. How do I make sure that payment from party A going to party B Smart in another country or, yeah. reaches there with the shortest possible time and goes via the banks which have the shortest possible route. So short, uh, I mean, fastest route first logic routing. Mm. Routing by currencies and cutoffs because Asian currencies close earlier. And we are in the Middle East, which is kind of in the middle of both sides. So how do you ensure that you process in time so that a Japanese payment goes out faster than a dirham payment goes out? Because I have more time to make a dirham payment. But I have less time to make a dirham payment. I mean, a Japanese yen payment because of difference in time. Yeah. So how do you build a routing engine which is able to take all those factors into account and then be able to route a payment so you can give the same experience? Uh, it's a very important uh, part of what customers want. Last but not the least... They want to be able to uh, look at penny validation. So what I mean by that is, who am I paying? Am I paying the right counterparty? Is it the right uh, person who's being paid in that chain? Because fraud's a big element of all payments right now. So they want, I mean, when you're making supplier payments or when you're making third-party payments, are you paying the right person? Do you have the right account number? And that IBAN validation service is, again, something that most customers ask for. These four things, Sean, haven't changed, I think, from okay. the time I've been looking at it. Mm -hmm. I don't think any customer has asked us anything which is, I mean, very different from any of these four things. They remain fundamental to a payment space. So we continue to invest in that space. Trade finance. Uh, on the back of MLETR regulations, which now allow digitized documents for trade, we're looking to innovate on that side and see how we can deliver a true disruption in the trade finance space. Trade finance has not seen much disruption historically mm. because you still need original documents to process. You still need an original bill of lading. Some may argue that, you know, you can use an e-bill of lading, but the acceptance of that is not very wide and common because yeah. it was not considered legal. Legally you know, binding. Yeah, binding absolutely. in many countries, etc. With MLETR, that's now become a little easier. And with UK adopting MLETR, 70% of the world's trade documents are English law based. Yeah. So we're looking to see how we can change that space. We're looking to see how we can make that journey for our customers easier to submit digital documents, transact digitally. And I think also the entire experience around the whole trade piece is ripe for disruption because we've never looked at it from that lens ever. It's always been running in the same way that it was running for the last 50 years. Yeah. So that's a big area of investment for us. We're looking at APIs there. We're looking at machine learning based tools there to help customers uh, give out LC wetting uh, guarantee text waiting, things like that. So we're working on that, doing a few POCs with a few fintechs to see how we can do that. One of the latest announcements that we've done is with Enigia and Vine is on digital identity. Mm -hmm. A key piece of 
trade, especially cross-border trade, is how do you identify who signed the document? Yeah. Right. So within our ecosystem, we have the signatories. We know who signed it. But if I send a document to, let's say, JP Morgan Chase, how does JP Morgan know who signed it? And how can we build a digital infrastructure which is able to create unique digital identities? Mm. So this is a project that we did with these two fintechs and uh, it was quite useful because this is a big problem for trade to go digital. Unless you can take signatures and signing authorities and make it universal, mm. it's very difficult to exchange documents and trade. Build the trust it. across the banks. You have to yeah, build absolutely. that across the banks. That's another area for investment. Uh, payment gateways and acquiring is another big focus area for us this year. Uh, we're building out our payment acquiring services and with that, our e-commerce services. So if you look at any corporate cycle, I mean, we do cash management for all our clients. This was one product suite that we were missing. Mm -hmm. We did not offer as ENVD, we did not offer an acquiring service. So now we offer an acquiring, full-fledged acquiring services under the brand name of MSNVD Pay. We're continuing to build that product suite out. We are about a year old in this business. Uh, we're still building this business out and we are uh, coming up with some exciting uh, announcements in the next couple of weeks on this space uh, with some fintech tie-ups to see how we're going to expand this business and give more of an offering. This is something that we intend to take to all of our markets, not just in UAE, but mainly Saudi and UAE, I mean, uh, Egypt as well, as part of the NVD growth uh, trajectory in these markets. So we will be launching it in these markets as well. Very, very cool. So I'm thinking uh, for customers listening to this, right? Payments, we're investing heavily in there. So expect instant, trackable, easily to reconcile payments, right? Um, looking at trade, a lot of disruption there happening around digital identity uh, and speeding things up, digitizing the whole process. Um, and then finally, Emirates NBD Pay, uh, looking at sort of the merchant side of things, the e-commerce side of things. Okay, just to wrap us up, Anit, we're at Dubai Fintech Summit. Um, what's, and I know we're at the beginning of it, so it's hard to say, what can you uh, remember? Is there one thing that you particularly look forward to or that you usually sort of enjoy from the Dubai FinTech Summit? I think it's very exciting to see the number of companies that are here. So I just did a walk around uh, on the stalls on some of the, uh, looking at some of the companies. Some are common names, people we've met in the past as part of our FinTech outreach program. Some are new entries. And I really find it interesting to see what, are the use cases that people are solving for. Uh, because in many cases, when we work with fintechs, we understand there's technology. And as in, as the adage goes, I mean, technology is looking for a problem to solve for, yeah. right? A lot of these companies have the right technology or are very fast, very nimble, very quick. But are they solving the right problem? And what is that problem? Or what's, what is the problem statement that they're trying to solve for? In the world that we work from and within banking, we sometimes see that some of those technologies have interplays with other things we do and mm. we can actually use them in other contexts as well. So I find that very interesting to go and meet all of these guys, look at what they're doing, what problems they're solving, because a lot of it is centric around retail customers, not necessarily B2B, mm. and then being able to see how can you use that in a B2B context. So that is a lot of uh, excitement for me personally. I mean, that's where I would spend a lot of time looking at these fintechs. Awesome. Anit, thank you so much for being here with us. Have a great Dubai Fintech Summit. Thank you. You too.